Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say it's a great pleasure to be speaking here at this conference. Um, most of the new results which I'll speak about are joint work with Daisuke Yamakawa and Robert Paluba. Um, so the basic st story is about how to sort of, well, one, way, well, one way to attach spaces to surfaces. Um, there's a quite long and complicated talk, so I'll try to start with a precise statement um, before I sort of speed up in the rest of it. So suppose I have a smooth algebraic curve over C, um, then there's a well-known picture of how to attach a moduli space of flat connections to this, the, the character varieties, which were shown to be symplectic by Atiyah, Bott, and Goldman. Um, so this is often looked at as moduli spaces of flat connections, but there's a, a sort of a, a slightly stronger algebraic statement, and you can taste the, you know, the difference in algebraic structures on the spaces of representations of the fundamental group and the, the spaces of connections. So over here, we look at you know, algebraic connections on algebraic vector bundles on the curve, um, which have this condition of having regular singularities at each puncture. Um, so this is the statement that appears in Deline's book in 1970, and maybe on curves had been looked at b b before, but there's d debate about the precise history. Um, so having phrased it in this way, it's clear that one should be able to extend this by loosening the condition of having regular poles. Um, so I can look at a larger category of um, the connections on vector bundles that corresponds to the Stokes and Minogamy data. Um, and these also have, have nice symplectic structures as well. Um, this was looked at in my thesis and um, more algebraically later on, and the statement was completed in this work with Daisuke from 2015. Um, so we have a large class of spaces which extend these moduli spaces of flat connections which had been looked at before. Um, and it's possible to get sort of generalizations of the braid group actions which uh, uh, occur here um, in this generalized picture by enriching the notion of a Riemann surface by taking into account part of the boundary conditions which occur. Um, so that's the basic picture. Um, the original story was enriched by Hitchin, um, who showed that these are not just complex symplectic, but they actually have hyperkähler metrics as well. And in a different co complex structure, they're isomorphic to um, Hitchin's systems, and so in particular have Lagrangian torus vibrations. Um, so if you think of that in the other complex structures, these give a large class of examples of, of non-compact special Lagrangian vibrations. Um, this story was extended with Bicard to sh show that even th the wild spaces at the, the bottom also have this extra structure. <laughs> and so there's a sort of large cl class of rich spaces which occur. Um, so this could perhaps be looked at as the state of the art in sort of moduli of linear ordinary differential e equations. Um, but we actually got to this picture by trying to understand better certain classes of non-linear differential equations. And so I want to b back up a bit and explain the picture behind it um, and then ask questions about the cl classification of the spaces which occur. Um, OK, so suppose you want to classify algebraic integrable systems. You need to have a definition. Definition. And so let's look at pairs. M is a holomorphic or an algebraic symplectic manifold. And I have a map chi to a vector space of half the dimension such that generic fibers are smooth at Lagrangian abelian varieties. Um, so that's an extremely sort of large and difficult problem. So to make it slightly easier, I want to restrict to a special cl cl class. Um, those which admit a, a lax representation. Um, so here I mean, basically I want it to be a symplectic leaf of a meromorphic Hitchin system. So in the case where the base curve is gene to zero, that's essentially the classical de 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 definition of a, a, a lax pair, um, but it also includes the extension to arbitrary genus base curves as was first looked at by Hitchin in the case without poles. Um, I've also put in the word good, and so it's as if that there's a sort of a slightly naive algebraic perspective. Um, so it's not true. If you look at 
Higgs bundles that have arbitrary order poles, it's not true that every symplectic leaf is an algebraic integrable system in this de definition here. So you would like to pick out the um, symplectic leaves which are good, such that they do have this structure. And also, I guess the main motivation was such that we do have hyperkähler metrics on them and correspondences with moduli space of connections as well, and thus a description of these in terms of Stokes and Monodromy data. And so I would like to, at some point, try to make slightly more precise what I mean by good, but it's, it's quite technical. Um, and so we would like to try to classify these up to isomorphism or perhaps up to deformation or isotogeny. Um, and then look at the different representations or re realizations of each of these sort of abstract spaces um, or abstract integrable systems. Can, can you take a second and say what this last means? Yeah. Yeah. Is this curve tied to the Billy variety or? It's a symplectic leaf of a meromorphic Hitchens system. So in a moment, I'll define Hitchens systems. And so it's possible to do that with the poles. And then you look at the symplectic leaves. And so, some of those would be integrable. And so that's the um, class of integrable systems I want to have a look at. Uh, is that OK? Um, so a large class of examples looks at classically as isospectral deformations of rational matrices. So here I have a matrix depending rationally on a parameter z. Um, and one looks at the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, and this gives the definition of the spectral curve. Um, and you can construct symplectic moduli spaces of these by, if you actually look at A d d dz and fix the orbits of the polar parts at, at each pole of A, then this amounts to be a symplectic qu quotient, and this gives m star a, a symplectic structure. Um, so I'm just fixing the, the orbits of the principal parts at each pole. Um, and lots of examples of integrable systems can be put into this picture, for instance, go going back to Jacobi and Garnier and others. Um, so the Hitchens systems look like this, at least for GLN. Um, so Hitchin looks at the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of stable bundles <coughs> on the curve. So this is pairs consisting of a stable vector to bundle and a cotangent vector phi. Um, and so this is just a section of NV tense with omega 1. Um, and then it's possible to relax slightly the fact that V is stable to have a stable pair. Um, so you get this slightly larger moduli space, which th th then has a, a proper map. Um, generalizing the characteristic polynomial that we looked at before. This is the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles. So a Higgs pair is a pair like this, where the pair is stable, but that does not imply that V itself has to be, be stable. So it's a partial compactification of the cotangent bundle of bun G. Um, so that's another large class of algebraic integrable systems. So H is the base of Higgs system? Yes, H is the Higgs base here. It will be something else later on, uh, I think. Uh, and so having this hyperkähler metric means that the same space has a different algebraic structure. It's naturally diffeomorphic to a moduli space of con connections. Um, and then you, you have this other change in algebraic structure to go to the, the Betty picture, the space of representations of the fundamental groups. So the picture is more that you have this sort of abstract space with these three different algebraic structures and ve various sort of diffeomorphisms, but you know, sort of, yeah, diffeomorphisms between the algebraic spaces which occur. Um, Okay, so over in the structure on the left here, the Dolbeau structure, we get this Hitchin system, and so that's a certain class of non-linear differential equations. When we look at it from the connection perspective, here we get a different class of differential equations when you vary the moduli of the curve. Um, these are the isomonogamy equations, or the non-abelian Gauss-Mannin connection. So now I have a family of curves, all of which are smooth, and we look at the corresponding Dirac moduli spaces over that, and so we get this bundle of Dirac spaces. The basic statement is that that has a natural flat algebraic connection on it, and if you write it out explicitly in algebraic coordinates, it gives non-linear di differential equations with respect to the moduli of the curve. Um, so these are the isomonogamy equations. Um, so at the end of the day, if we try to classify all of this structure, we're actually classifying sort of two classes of differential equations, the integrable systems and the isomonogamy systems. It's, it's actually quite good to pass over to this isomonogamy 
be an imaginary picture because there's lots of very precise work on the moduli spaces of low dimension, in particular of complex dimension two, especially the work of Okamoto, and we can use that to try to sort of build a theory of Dinkin graphs to try to classify the spaces <laughs> of larger dimension. Um, so this leads to the definition of a non-abelian Hodge space, which is a hyper space with these three pre pre preferred algebraic structures, such that in one particular algebraic structure, it is now an integrable system, um, which is a symplectic leaf of a meromorphic Hitchin system. Um, so that's sort of a vague version of the basic <coughs> question. Um, I guess one point is that lots of this picture has been extended to higher dimensions, but there's no new examples of such spaces which occur. So it could be that all of the examples which occur, occur for curves. And so that's an open question which is not known as far as I know. Um, uh, so let's go back to the sort of extension of the Hitchin picture to the case with poles. We want to, for instance, put in the rational matrix picture into the sort of theory of meromorphic Hitchin systems. And this ju ju just appears by saying that A dz is a meromorphic Higgs field on a trivial ve ve vector bundle, or it could be looked at as a connection on a trivial vector bundle as well. Um, <laughs> And then the statement is that the spaces M star we looked at before often have partial compactifications which have this full hyperkähler picture. picture. Um, so I've stated this quite vaguely. This is the work of lots of different people and I've probably missed out several people. The first algebraic part is to do with Nitsure constructed the moduli space and showed that the meromorphic Hitchin map is proper. Um, Botichin and Markman looked at the um, algebraic Poisson structures and showed that they were integrable systems in the Poisson sense, ignoring this question about which symplectic beams actually are um, integrable systems in the precise definition I have before. Um, it's possible to look at the sort of irregular extension of the atia bot symplectic structures um, analytically. Um, that was the infinite dimensional symplectic qu quotient structure that was up construction, that was upgraded in this work with Bicard to get these sort of generalizations of the Hitchin metrics. Um, and then Woodhouse and Critchiver wanted to compute more explicitly the symplectic structures there, and so there's papers of them, in particular examples. <coughs> and this led to the quasi-Hamiltonian approach I'll speak about a bit here, which started in 2002, and we completed the most general statement in 2015, even with the case with, um, with, with um, twisted formal structure at the poles, and it's possible to also have twists in the interior of the curve as well. So it's um, connections on, on torsors for twisted group schemes over the curve. <laughs> but that's quite abstract, and so I'll actually specialise to examples and explain so those. What is meromorphic Higgs field and <coughs> meromorphic connection? Means, uh, what is Higgs field there? Means why you what Higgs field? <laughs> So a Higgs field was a section of NV tensor omega 1. A meromorphic Higgs field is a section of NV tensor omega 1D for a positive divisor D. So I'm al allowed to have poles. Um, and a connection is an operator which satisfies Leibniz rule. Uh, OK, so we have basically the same picture as before, except we're allowed to put in the word wild and meromorphic in various di different places that you have these three algebraic structures. You have the wild character variety here, and you have these meromorphic Higgs bundle moduli spaces and meromorphic connections, and you have this analytic or real analytic isomorphism between them, which changes the complex structure. Um, RHB for? Riemann Hilbert Birkhoff, or if you like, irregular Riemann Hilbert. Uh, there's this paper of Birkhoff from 1909, which was perhaps the, the first to s suggest how to use the Stokes data to classify connections with higher order poles. Um, so people often speak of Riemann Hilbert Birkhoff. Um, OK, so the picture is something like this. Um, so we have a curve with some mark points, and we do the real oriented blow up to get these blue circles here. Um, and then we have this halo, which is like a neighbourhood of these boundary circles. Um, so the basic point is that there's a well-known and standard formal classification of irregular connections at the poles. Connections
exceptions are formally classified by graded local systems on this circle or on this small annulus here. Um, and so no matter what else we do, the formal classification gives us a graded local system. Um, and so you know, that is the topological thing which cl classifies um, irregular connections um, formally. Um, so the usual tame picture, you just <laughs> take the graded system to be all in one graded piece. Um, so one way to present what the Stokes data is, we want to glue the graded system here onto the local system of solutions in the interior of the curve. Um, and if you look at the multi summation approach, this gives us preferred analytic isomorphisms between the gra graded system and the solutions of the curve here. So it's possible to glue these together to give a local system on the whole curve, except for the fact that these isomorphisms jump in certain singular or anti-Stokes directions. And so we have to add these extra punctures when we glue the graded system onto the um, local system of solutions in the interior. In particular, the monogamy of the graded system does not need to be conjugate to the monogamy of the actual connection around the pole. It makes no difference, but yeah, it's topologically equivalent and we just want to get a topological picture. Here I've drawn it on the real blood blow up, but that just makes a difference about what's happening at the blue edge, which is away from there. Um, okay, so you end up with an object I call a Stokes local system, which um, classifies the connections we had to start off with. Um, I'll come back with more precise examples in a moment. So the basic picture is that there's a reduction of structure group to this graded system at the poles. And so it's as if you're breaking it into these individual pieces and you, you have a picture like this, at least in the untwisted case. And the twisted picture is more like the picture I had at the start where the gra 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 graded pieces are twisted around as you go around the circle. Um, okay. Uh, so it's actually graded by a cover of the circle. Um, I'll get to an example of the area equation where, where it's, it's graded by the irregular type and that involves the uh, z to the 3 over 2 and you'll see that that twists around um, later on. Um, yeah, I'm sketching a bit because there's lots of stuff here. Um, um, there are papers which explain it all in great detail depth. I'm just trying to give the picture of what's happening in this talk. Um, so the basic aim would be to write out a list of examples just by having a look at papers and then try to work out which are isomorphic as abstract, you know, sort of non-abelian Hodge spaces. Um, so for instance, one might look at examples like this. Here you get the shift of argument integrable system. So I have one pole of order one and a pole of order two. Um, the isomonogamy systems are a special case of the Jimbo, Miwa, Mori and Sato system that was looked at in 1979, I think. The corresponding Stokes picture, um, well, a slightly framed version of the Stokes picture gives this holomorphic Poisson manifold G star, which is the holomorphic Poisson manifold that you want to quantize to get the Drinfeld-Jimbo quantum group. And so even quite simple examples of wild character spaces give you know, extremely interesting Poisson varieties here. Um, so the standard tame picture on P1 would look like this. You're looking at connections having first order poles, so logarithmic connections on the trivial vector bundle. Um, the integrable systems worked out by Garnier. The isomonogamy systems were looked at by Schlesinger slightly earlier. Garnier's work occurred by taking the autonomous limit of the Schlesinger system. And the Be Betty picture is the familiar space of representations of the fundamental group of a, a punctured sphere into G. Um, now, the basic fact is that these two rows are isomorphic, that, that, that there's algebraic isomorphisms between the full spaces in each column. Um, so for the integrable systems, this goes back to Adams, Harnad, Hertebees, um, and then Harnad extended it to the isomonogamy picture over here and showed that the isomonogamy equations match up. Um, and one could understand it intrinsically for, as the Fourier-Laplace transformation on D modules on the affine line or on sort of presentations of the D modules. The matrices A, B, P and Q which occur occur in a particular presentation of D modules on the affine line. Um, so 
basically it all goes back to the Fourier Laplace transformation. Um, for example, one of the simplest cases to have a look at is, is GL2 on the four punctured sphere. So if I take the matrices here to be two by two, the corresponding isomenotropy deformations are equivalent to the panel of A6 differential equation, which is this sort of horrendous non-linear differential equation, which can be viewed as a non-linear analogue of the Gauss hypergeometric equation. The corresponding Betty space is this frick klein vocht cubic surface, um, so you've got constants A, B, C, and D, which match up with the four conjugacy classes of monodromy that you want to pick. Um, and so this has this um, explicit description, at least if we take the Betty weights to be trivial, otherwise it might not be affine. Um, okay, and so we can then see how this appears from each of these descriptions. From the standard two by two picture, you just take four conjugacy classes in the group G GL2 and you do this multiplicative or quasi-Hamiltonian reduction. So you take the product to be equal to one and quotient by the group GL2 and you compute it has dimension two. Um, exactly the same space occurs in the irregular picture at the top. Here you start with SL3. So you just have one tame pole and regular pole and so you end up looking at a generic symplectic leaf in the group SL3 star, the dual Poisson Lee group. These have the same dimension as co adjoint orbits of SL3, so a generic orbit has dimension six. And then you want to do the symplectic quotient by the torus, and so you subtract off two twice, and again you get two. And it's possible to compute explicitly what the space is, and again get this Frick Klein cubic, that these really are sort of different representations of the same abstract space. And one can do the, the same with the lax pairs for the actual isomenotomy equations and for the um, integrable systems, which is really what Harnad and Adams Har Harnad Hertebees did. Okay. Um. So you can look for different representations as well. So for instance, suppose you take the complex simple group G2, um, you can try to choose conjugacy classes in there such that you again get the dimension two. Um, so this is in the tame picture. So G2 has a nice six-dimensional semi-simple class. Um, so we take three of those at three of the poles and then take the fourth pole to be a generic class which has dimension 12. And so the multiplicative symplectic qu quotient has the dimension three times six plus 12 minus twice the dimension of the group. Um, so you end up with dimension two. Um, and with Paluba, we computed explicitly what it is and we got the Frick Klein Vogt surfaces in the case where they're symmetric. So we have A equals B equals to C. And so you just end up with two parameters which matches up with the eigenvalues in this generic class here. And so you know, there's even representations of these spaces if you go beyond um, general Guinea groups as well. Um, okay. Um, you might look at a different example like panel of A2. Here we have two by two matrices with one pole of order four. This gives the panel of A2 differential equation. The Betty surface, which occurs first appeared, I think, in a paper of Flaschka and Newell, um, and looks like this. It's like an irregular analogue of the, um, the Frick Klein surface. You just have one parameter, which corresponds to the monodromy of this graded lo local system around the pole of order two, the formal monodromy. Um, so that's an explicit description of some space as a nice hyperkähler metric. Uh, so one can carry on and draw this large table and then try to look at isomorphisms of them. So I now want to discuss a bit about the Dinkin graphs that one can try to classify certain examples of these with. Are there any questions at the moment before I sort of switch over to graphs? Mm. Okay. So they're all clustered, yeah? This I don't know, you need to ask the experts. I, I, I think it's more sort of we constructed these first and then they came up with some spaces so it's more their job to sort of prove if it's isomorphic or not, um, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, so in this work of Okamoto in the 80s, um, he computed the affine vial symmetry groups of the panel of A equations. Um, so for instance, for panel of A6, he found the affine D4 vial group, um, and for panel of A2, he had affine A1. Um, so you would like to think that you know, affine D4 is something to do with rank two connections 
on a four punctured sphere. And so you draw a picture of that, and then, then you draw the picture of the affine Dinkin graph here, and you think, well, there's four legs, and so I'd have these four punctures, and maybe the two, the dimension vector that you pick there matches up with the two over here. Um, so, uh, you know, that looks reasonably clear, and that's been extended to arbitrary sort of tame connections on P1. Um, you can prove slightly more if you look at the, the quiver variety of type D, D, D4. This is on the nose, isomorphic to this open part of the moduli space where the bump is holomorphically trivial. And so you know, there's a slightly d different precise statement that this open part is naturally attached to affine D4. Um, it's the corresponding ALE space. Um, so one would like to extend this to panel of A2 for it example, that there should be some direct relation between the affine A1 graph with dimensions 1 and 1 and rank 2 bundles having a pole of order 4. So the singular directions would look like this. And it's not completely clear. I mean, this looks different to that. But the story is that one can relate the Stokes data here to this. And one can also look at the open parts as well. The open parts is reasonably easy, but perhaps not obvious. So. There's an open part to the moduli space, this M star, and that is isomorphic to the A1 ALE space, or the iguchi hansen space, the first example of a, a non-flat hypercalar metric. So in one complex structure, it's just the cotangent bundle of P P1, and in a different complex structure, it's a generic orbit, a generic co-joint orbit of, of SL2C. Um, OK. So let me recall briefly this story of Nakajima quiver spaces. Um, so there's a well-established story of how to attach a space to a graph. Um, so suppose the gra graph is this. We put a vector space at each node, um, and we look at the space of maps in both directions along each edge. Um, so we have maps A and B in each direction like this. Um, and if you choose an orientation of the graph, this is a complex symplectic vector space. And the graded automorphisms acts in a Hamiltonian way. So here, the moment map for the action of this group H, the product of the groups at the nodes, is given by something like this AB on one component and minus BA in the other. And the aim is to just look at the, the complex symplectic quotient of this large symplectic vector space by the graded group H um, at a central or a scalar value of the moment map. So we choose a complex scalar at at each node, and we look at mu inverse of lambda quotient by h, so we have a space attached to the graph with this list of dimensions at each node, plus the choice of these complex scalars. Um, there's a slightly richer version where you look at stability conditions, but let's ignore that here. Um, right, so the picture extends to an arbitrary graph easily just by re repeating on each edge. Um, so I guess this was first looked at in dimension two examples in Kronheimer's thesis. Um, and he looks at these ALE spaces for arbitrary ADE um, subgroups of SU2, or ADE Dinkin graphs, affine graphs. And the point is here that if you take the vector of dimensions to be the minimal null root, you end up with something of complex dimension two. So in particular, for these two examples that we looked at before, you do indeed get space of complex dimension two, which fits in with the fact that these these pan lavey equations are second order, that they're geometrically a, a connection on a fibre bundle with dimension two fibres. Um, OK, this has a multiplicative version that was looked at by Crawley, Boovey and Shaw, um, and then extended by Vandenberg to get the symplectic structures as well. So we look at the multiplicative version of before in the sense that you look at the open parts of the representations of the graph, what could be called the invertible representations by putting in this condition that 1 plus AB is invertible. Um, so this is a well-known condition that occurs in the local classification of regular holonomic D modules on a disk, taking A and B to be the var and can maps. Um, but for us, the crucial point perhaps is this statement proved by Vandenberg that it has a natural quasi-Hamiltonian or multiplicative Hamiltonian structure with the group as before, but the moment map is given by 1 plus AB and 1 plus BA, the, the monodromy and the micro monodromy um, that occurred in the previous talk with slightly different conventions on the signs. Um, 
So one can now take an arbitrary graph and fuse together this construction on each edge and you get a holomorphic symplectic space by d doing the reduction as before. Um, and this is good in the tame case because it's possible to check that the multiplicative quiver variety attached to the affine d4 star with dimensions 2, 1, 1, 1, 1 is indeed isomorphic algebraically to this um, uh, frick klein vot surface. Um, so let's call this space B, V1, V2, the Vandenberg space. And the question would be, well, um, suppose I have a double edge. Well, the classical theory of multiplicative qu quivers would say to take two of these edges and to fuse together. And so this means you take the product of the moment maps that you had before. So you'll get something like 1 plus AB times 1 plus CD for the moment map there. And you can look at the reductions of this. Um, and no one knows how to put a complete hyperkähler metric on these. Um, the point is that through this Stokes business, taking the wild character space associated to panel of A2, we get a space we do know how to get a, a, a metric on that it involves slightly different quasi-Hamiltonian spaces. And we can repeat this for triple edges and lots of other types of gra graphs as well. Um, so, so the question is perhaps, what is re rep star? And can we put a, a quasi-Hamiltonian structure on it? Um, so the point is perhaps that it's, it's not quite the right statement to put these edges together. Um, OK, so to understand what to do, you can go back to the paper of 1764 of Euler. And if you read the third page of this, there's a list of the Euler continuant polynomials, the second of which is the 1 plus AB that we got from this var and can picture before, and the fourth of which is this degree 4 polynomial, which is very close to 1 plus AB times 1 plus CD, but it has this extra term, this AD, which is here. Um, so it's different. And this is the one that occurs in the Stokes story. Um, the general rule for these continuum polynomials is that you take the product of the min 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 monomials which occur, the, pr the, the first monomial is the product of the symbols which occur, and then you delete all possible consecutive pairs. So for instance, for A, B, C, I have the product of all, and then I would delete A, B, and then I would delete B, C, and that's it. Um, so you get this extra term here by deleting B, C um, in the middle there. Um, yeah, and you can check its difference to 1 plus AB times 1 plus CD. Um, and as I said, if you learn about the Stokes data, it's possible to see that these actually are quasi-Hamiltonian moment maps. And I want to sort of explain how this occurs in this particular example. Um, there are various different ways to describe what the Stokes data is. Um, we use this multi-summation approach that goes back to Eccal and Graham Ease and others. And this is actually closest to what occurs in Stokes's paper. He actually, you know, where he has his discontinuities are the things that we now call the singular or the anti-Stokes directions, um, even though he did not have Borel's summation. Yeah. Uh, so the well, an other way to describe the Stokes data is just to look at the, the flags of exponential growth rates of solutions. So I have a connection on a, a disk, and you go towards the pole at the infinite point, and you just look at the flags or the filtrations which occur by looking at the, the exponential growth rates of solutions on the sectors. And these switch around as you pass these Stokes directions. So over here, we have the anti-Stokes directions, but the the flag switched around on the, the, the Stokes directions. Um, this was first looked at, I think, at least as far as I know, um, for rank two by Sibuya, where in rank two, two, your flag just amounts to one particular ray of solutions, which were the, the subdominant solutions that he looked at. And it was extended to arbitrary GLN connections in the, the letters of Deline in 1978. And I think that this was proved by Malgrange. Um, so in particular, in this example, you have a slightly different description of the Flaschke neural surface um, in terms of the six tuples of points which occur by taking these rays. Um, so the formal monogamy, the constant will, will, which occurs, turns out to be the multi-ratio of the six points um, taking the rays of the subdominant solutions on, on the sexes. 
Um, okay. Um, so these are equivalent pictures. It's possible to pass between the two pictures algebraically, but it's easier to classify what the Stokes local systems are. It is a special type of the local. Um, it is a special type of local system on this disk having extra bunches, and so it's it's classified by its monogamy. Um, so here's a picture of how to pass between the two pictures. You basically take the associated graded and um, all of the maps here isomorphism. Perhaps I'll skip over it. The, the, this picture is out of a paper. Um, but yeah, that explains what to do. Um, OK. So the general picture looks like this, um, the framework for most of the complex symplectic things we do. So over here you have this sort of standard sort of finite dimensional symplectic picture and you have the Hamiltonian picture having actions of the groups here and lots of these additive spaces occur as symplectic equations of products of co-adjoins orbits using the standard you know, symplectic equation or you know, the complex symplectic quotient. At the top is this infinite dimensional Tia-Bot picture um, where you have this nice f fact that the curvature is the moment map for the action of the gauge group on the space of all smooth connections on a fixed underlying topological bundle. And so when you look at the symplectic quotients here, you end up with the modular space of flat connections. And that, that, that explains nicely why the character spaces are symplectic. Um, so this has a, an algebraic approach where you just go up a bit, you frame just at one point on the boundary, and you get to this quasi-Hamiltonian picture, um, first looked at by Alexei of Malkin and Mein Renkin as a sort of a re reinterpretation of work just before by Lisa Jeffrey and Hubschman, and perhaps others as well. So the point is, by lifting up a bit, it's possible to work in the world of smooth, affine varieties. Um, you don't need to go up to this analytic perspective, at least to get the complex symplectic structure. To get the, the metric, it seems you still need to go back up to the top. Um, and then the multiplicative symplectic equation is the way to forget the framing, and the m moment map turns out to be the monogamy around the boundary in most of the examples. And so you end up with, with a nice algebraic construction of the spaces at the bottom. Um, so for instance, you might look at spaces of tame connections like this and interpret this symplectic equation as a, a space of connections having first order poles. Um, and then you have the Riemann-Hilbert map, map, which is a transcendental map between these two algebraic symplectic spaces, um, like an analog of yeah, the exponential. Um, this this matches up the complex symplectic structures, but both spaces actually do have hyperkähler metrics as well. The metric here is more algebraic and is different to the metric which occurs from this, this Hitchin type picture. Sorry, here in your group is a complex solid? Yes, yeah. I'm always looking at things like GLN or an arbitrary complex reductive group. Uh, and then we can um, extend the picture. So, in my thesis, I looked at the picture at the top and extended the, the atia bot construction. And then later on, after this work of Woodhouse, I extended the quasi-Hamiltonian picture as well to get both an analytic and an algebraic construction of these symplectic structures on these wild character varieties at the bottom. And this was completed in this work with Daisuke in 2015. Um, so we have a sort of enrichment of the spaces that people have looked at before. Um, OK, so now I want to run through quite quickly the sort of the definition of these spaces, what's happening. I guess we have the picture, um, so I'll be quite quick. The usual picture is just that you take a surface, you look at the space of representations of the fundamental group. So e.g. G, G, G is GLNC. Um, and then you have the Riemann-Hilbert co correspondence to the connections. Um, and then you can look at the tame picture if you have some marked points as well. Um, you can look at the space of representations of the punctured curve. Um, then they have like a naive space here or a set of isomorphism classes. To do a moduli space properly, you need to look at extensions across the punctures, and I'll mention something about that in a moment, but the basic picture is that you have these two different algebraic structures here. Um, if you just look at all of the connections, not the ones with... Is it important to have these punctures or not? You can have no punctures. You can, but that would be the picture that was looked at before. That's the usual Hitchin, a tier bot 
picture. Um, uh, so if you just delete the condition, you'll get some infinite dimensional Poisson scheme here. And so we, that has a Poisson structure. We want to look at the symplectic leaves, which turn out to be finite the dimensional. And so we need to fix extra structure at the poles, which gives us the finite dimensional spaces. So we need to fix the irregular type. Now, part of the wisdom that comes from isomenogamy is that the extra data that you fix at the poles behaves exactly like the moduli of the curve. Uh, so this is not at all clear to start off with, but there's particular examples with the Laplace transformation where the irregular type does match up with the positions of the, the poles. And so this, this you know, genuinely is an extension of the notion of the underlying Riemann surface. Um, so at the end of the day, we'll define a wild surface or an irregular curve to be an, a curve with the marked points plus an irregular the type. And we can braid the irregular types just like you might braid the points as well. But we could take a different structure group. And so immediately we start to get the G braid groups occur and um, cabled versions of them. Um, OK, so there are notions of the twisted irregular types where you fix a Cartan subalgebra. Um, these can always be straightened out by taking a root of the coordinate. So let's start out with a straightened Cartan subalgebra. And we use the principal part of this to fix the irregular type of the connections. So we put in the condition that the connection in some trivialization is isomorphic to DQ, the irregular part, plus something having poles of at most one, something logarithmic. And so that fixes you know, the structure at the pole, at least the irregular part. Um, and then we get nice spaces that have symplectic structures. And so the picture before was that you had a surface that gave you a space. Now the data you want to fix is a wild surface, which is this tri triple. Um, and at the end of the day, you want to look at the deformations of that, which gives the wild mapping class group. But I'll generally just fix the, the curve today. Um, so that's the picture. As I mentioned before, that to do this properly, you really want to look at extensions across the punches, and you want to look at the parabolic version of that. And then in general, for arbitrary reductive groups, you want to look at the parahoric extension. And then you need to put in a condition about how the connection is compatible with the parahoric extension. So there's a paper which explains carefully what a logohoric connection is, but the statement is this. You want to be able to pass to a cover such that it becomes very good. So basically, you fix a weight, and this gives a filtration of your loop algebra. Um, and you want to look at connections which go one step be be beyond the positive part of that. And so that's the notion of a theta, lo a theta logohoric connection. Um, so you want connect connections which have an irregular part plus something which is theta <laughs> logohoric. And that's the natural extension of what we did b before here. And then you want to look at the ones which are twisted. And so you only put in the condition that after a finite cyclic cover, it becomes very good in this, in this sense. Um, so it seems to me that these are the connections for which we have a Riemann-Hilbert-Birkhoff correspondence and we have a co correspondence with Higgs bundles as well. And it seems to me that the other ones, we, we, we don't know what to do. Um, um, there's also the question of whether or not these are the good ones in the sense that is the corresponding hitch in system, an integrable system in the de definition which I had. Uh, is he OK? Is, should I stop the talk? <laughs> um, um, so there is the question about w w w w whether or not good here also matches up with, with, with the fact that the Hitchens systems are integrable or not. I've not looked at it, but there are some work of Baraglia and Cam Garpour that they have a weaker conjecture, and that is compatible with this general statement here, but that would be good to know. Um, OK, so let's go back to our example to get the continuance. Um, so you have a disk just with one marked point and an irregular type having a pole of order k. Um, you just have one term in the irregular type, this a here. So you have a disk. 
and the regular type determines various data, like the centralized is the maximal torus, the singular di di directions. Um, so solutions of these connections involve the term e to the q. Um, so this might look like this. And the terms e to the q1 and q2, they switch, they switch order of growth in different directions. And so you can draw this Stokes diagram of where it switches over. So these will be the Stokes directions here. And the singular directions are the ones which have the biggest difference. Um, and then we put these extra punches in in the singular directions and we get this halo and these extra punches. Um, so H is now the halo, if you're worried about H. Um, and you have a Stokes group. Um, so here you just get these unipotent groups, U plus and G minus. And you can define a Stokes local system to be a G local system on this curve with the extra punches. And you have this flat reduction where grading in the halo, and then you put in the condition that the monotropy around the extra punches has to be in the corresponding Stokes group. If I start in the halo, it's, gr gr it's graded, and so that condition makes sense. Um, so this defines a category which is equivalent to the category of connections with the fixed irregular types. Um, so the, it's, a, uh, um, it's a clean way to describe what the Stokes data is, but as, uh, as I explained, it's just the, the data that the multi summation picture gives you. Um, um, so if you start out with the filtration picture and want to classify those, you basically pass over to, to this picture and then say, hey, it's classified by the Stokes matrices, which are the monodromies around the extra punctures, but here's a, a base point independent description. Um, okay, so if we did want to classify these, we choose base points and we look at the fundamental group points and we look at paths between these and loops as well. And so we end up with this framed space of Stokes local systems, um, the Stokes representations of this groupoid in the group G. And so it's just the representation such that the monogamy around the halo is in this graded group H and the monogamy around the extra punches is in the Stokes groups. Um, so I proved in 2002 um, that these have quasi hamel structures as well. Um, this is probably the first large class of examples which don't appear from modular spaces of flat connections on curves directly. Um, this was actually proved for arbitrary complex reductive groups in this paper. Um, here the space is quite explicit. I can choose certain paths and I just get that the space is a product of G cross U plus cross U minus to the K cross H. Um, so we can now play with this to get to the continuance. Let's define the space to be A and call this the fission space because it's breaking the group from G to H. Um, and so if we call elements of it C, S and H. Um, so here I had a, a disk. Now I want to work in the case of a sphere just having the one mark point. So I want to glue a disk on the back of the, 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 the sphere. Um, so this is what the quasi-Hamiltonian reduction by G does here. Um, so you end up with this space which we call B, um, and explicitly we just write down what the moment map is and compute it that we, we, we've proved that this space is now a quasi-Hamiltonian H space because we've reduced by G. Um, so that's the statement we've got to at the moment. Uh, what time am I supposed to stop? Uh, half 35, so it's still okay. eight minutes. Jolly good. Um, so this leads easily to the continuance by computing what it is. If you use the Gauss factorization, you get to this. And so that means that the 1, 1 matrix entry is not 0. So if you look at the case of k equals 2, you get the 1 plus AB that Vandenberg looked at that occurs in regular holonomic D modules. Um, and you can prove actually that the quasi-Hamiltonian structure matches up as well with the same moment maps the H. So H as a function of the matrix entries which are left over is indeed this one plus AB that we had before. And then we look at these arbitrary sort of deeper products and we did do indeed get the Euler continuance. And so we see that those are moment maps as well. And we can define our open part, the answer to the question, what is rep star to be the space of representations of the graph where the Euler continuant is not zero as an extension of this fact that one plus AB is not, not zero. Um, 
So of course I got to this by trying to work out you know, the quasi-Hamiltonian spaces in Stokes data for arbitrary reductive groups. If you look at particular e examples, you get to sort of explicit statements like this. Um, so this is a very simple example, and one can ask, you know, what is the sort of more ge general picture that occurs? And in particular, how much of that picture is re related to, to quivers or graphs? So first of all, we could just, so here we had dimensions one and one. First of all, we could t take an arbitrary vector space at each node. So H then becomes non-abelian. Um, that's been done. And then we can replace the irregular type by this very simple one that we had before by an arbitrary GLN irregular type. And the class of graphs that replace the graph, which are here, um, are easy to describe explicitly. I call them fission graphs. And so there's lots of examples which occur. For instance, if I have a Q like this, you sort of work down and look at how the eigenspaces break up. So first of all, I would look at the eigenspace of the first term. I might have two here, and then it will break up into other pieces. I look at the joint eigenspaces of consecutive terms. So you get this fission tree. Um, and then the, there's a way to attach a graph to a fission tree. Um, so you get a quiver attached to an irregular type. And this quiver plays the role of the quiver that we had before. Um, that it defines in a space of invertible representations and a multiplicative quiver variety description of the wild character space. Um, okay, for instance, if you look at, try to look for the ones of dimension two, you will get the affine D4 and you will get the square. This occurred in Okamoto's work for um, Panlave 5. Uh, the triangle occurs for Panlave 4 and the affine A1 for Panlave 2, as we discussed before. Um, but you don't get the pentagon because it isn't a complete k-partite graph um, and it does not occur at all. Um, so that's a type of explanation of why the list of sp bases stops at the square um, and you don't get affine A4. Um, um, and then we need to look at the reduction. So we need to fix the graded, graded monogamy in terms of graphs that corresponds to gluing on extra legs. And so you end up with, with a class of graphs I call supernova graphs, which um, are like the fission graphs, but with extra edges. Um, and then we can look at the reductions and look at the corresponding multiplicative quiver spaces. And indeed, we do get the panel of a to space as we expected. Um, and you can go back and look at the additive picture and prove that the, the Nakajima quiver space of that graph is indeed um, symplexically isomorphic to the open part that occurs as a moduli space of connections on the trivial bundle um, um, like that. And so you have a picture that the riemann hilbert burkov map takes the additive, the standard quiver variety picture. It's a holomorphic symplectic map to the wild character space that has a description as a multiplicative quiver variety like this with this new definition of multiplicative quivers. Um, you can look at the spaces of complex dimension two. These are sort of a non-compact analog of the K3 surfaces, um, which I now call H3 surfaces after Higgs, Hitchin and Hodge. I mean, we have these three H's there. And so I think it's perhaps the correct name um, for these non-compact hypercalar, <coughs> but, 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 um, hypercalar manifolds. Um, so most of these occur in the panel of A story, um, like this for panel of A6 down to panel of A1 and 3 and things. Um, if you look at what the open parts are, so these become simpler hypercalar for but manifolds. Um, the ones on the left are diffeomorphic to the ALE spaces with this um, the corresponding symbol and the ones at the top right are the ALF spaces, for instance, the uh, Tia Hitchin space here. Um, at the bottom right, the open part is this C2 with the flat metric. Um, okay, so in the remaining time, I'll just go over what we did and, and sort of see how to understand the damn part of it slightly differently. Um, so we had this story where we had an edge and then we looked at a double edge and we said we could put the, 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 those together and the moment map is the products of what we did before, but there's a better thing we can do that involves this degree four continuance such that we know how to put hypercalar metrics on the quotient. Um, and then we play with these a bit. They have factorizations. 
Um, you can either factorize on the left or the right like this. And if you think about what that means, it's actually an, an algebraic inclusion of the spaces, either the left inclusion or the right inclusion. And it's possible to check directly that the quasi Hamiltonian structures match up. Um, and then you try to count all of the inclusions which occur if you factorize all of the way down. Um, so for this, we get 14. And in general, it's possible to prove that you get the Catalan number. So this does start to look sort of familiar. Um, you can deduce this because the operations L and R form so something, so each of which is associative, and then together they commute in one way but not the other. Um, this is the free duplicial algebra, and it's known that the pieces of that have dimension equal to the Catalan numbers, and so that explains that. But also the Catalan numbers occur in terms of triangulations of an n plus 2 gone. Um, of course, here, I'm now describing it in terms of graphs, but I started out with gluing surfaces. And so we can go back to the picture at the, the start that you know, our edge is a surface, and our doubled edge is a surface with these six singular directions. Um, the picture in the middle is the fusion of two edges. So I take the two edges and I fuse. Um, the fusion corresponds, as usual, to gluing into two of the three holes of a three-hole sphere. Um, so the inclusions say that this space is an open part of that in two <coughs> different ways. And for instance, the left product might look like this, where that gets glued like that, and that describes an open part of this. Um, but we want to get to triangulation, so we need to have a space attached to a triangle. Um, at the moment, we've got spaces attached to squares and hex hexagons. And so we then open Stokes's paper. So I can attest to the fact it's possible to think about Stokes' data for sort of 10 or 15 years without actually reading Stokes's pa paper. But if you do, you'll see that there is this picture in it. Um, and this is the Stokes diagram of the airy function, which has a Q which is, involves W to the 3 over 2, where W is 1 over Z, which is the coordinate I had before. So the pole is at the infinite point. Um, and then you can repeat what we did before and define twisted Stokes local systems um, and prove that these have twisted quasi Hamiltonian structures and you indeed have a space attached to the triangle. And then you can fuse those together just like we did before. Um, this completes this project of understanding the symplectic nature of the wild fundamental group as an analogue of Goldman's work on the symplectic nature of the fundamental group of a, a surface. So we now have these irregular poles and now we get the odd continuance as well. Um, in particular, B3 occurs for the case with the pentagon that we, we had in the picture at the start of the talk. Um, so this explains that we are actually triangulating a polygon by fusing these pictures, these pieces together. Um, of course, if you take the dimensions to be equal to 1, this is familiar from the complex WKB picture. Um, if you open Voros's paper, there are pictures like this. This is actually the same type of example which occurs for panel of A2. So you have these hexagons, and these really are pictures of triangulations of a hexagon. So let's look at the picture at the top. Um, so you have these Stokes lines and the cuts. If you delete the cuts, you get this. And then um, you replace these by triangles like that. And so his picture does mean that you have a triangulation of the hexagon. Um, and if you look in quantum me mechanics textbooks, then they really do approximate what's happening at the turning point, so the zero of the quadratic differential which occurs there is called the turning point. They, they do approximate in the asymptotics what's happening there by the airy picture, and so that does match up with gluing to get together these airy triangles to get a, a triangulated hexagon. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this Varos picture, you know, the paper by Gayota, Moore, and Natsky. Sure, sure. Yeah, all right. We generalize it highly. And they also give some, they assign something to tri triangles. So Yeah, I'm sure it must be related. I don't know if, you know, I'd like to draw a precise statement out of their paper. They have all of these pictures, and there's the stuff that was known before by Takei and others in J Japan. It's very hard to work out. I think if I go back to this 1983 paper, it's clear that that's before most of what was looked at before, and the picture is here. And, um, so we, we, we have this, this fusion picture which says how to glue pieces of the surface, and you know, it's not 
Yeah. Any other question? Is there an understanding how the uh, tame spaces degenerate to wild spaces when so, so when, when singularities merge together, monodromy goes to infinity, how tame spaces like, continuously degenerate into wild spaces? There's a paper of Garnier from 1920 okay. or something that started to look at this. Um, my perspective is a bit that we just want to understand what the spaces are and the structures yes. on them first, and then one can ask questions like that, that after. Okay. I think maybe one can now start having a look at it. Um, I think it's hard to make precise statements. I mean, one would like to get the wild metric from the tame ones or vice versa. I think there are stories that are analytically trying to glue the pieces together to approximate the Hitchin metric by the wild pieces. And so perhaps one wants to do that backwards, that it's actually simpler to work with the wild spaces than with the tame spaces. But there's lots of different things that people want to do. I mean, it's a quite rich story. My question is kind of the same. Um, Sort of for more theoretic reasons, I prefer not to. No, no, for oh. um, oh, uh. Well, now I'd rather sing something, but uh, um, the, uh, th th these things should have nice compactification, almost like normal crossing compactification, um, essentially unique. Um, do you know any single one of them that has this nice, like the one thing you had was this cubic surface. Right, you, you can know, look at complex red dimension two. Yeah. Then, then yeah, you get, I wonder if you know a single example where you have the compactification and you know it kind of in your world as some kind of, you know, some well, kind of space of things with connection. The odd spaces in rank two, I mean, you basically get this list of the odd continuance, and so it's all quite explicit there. Um, so I think there were some examples that S Simpson was having a look at. And, I was thinking that these might be simpler to look at first, uh, rather than he was looking at sort of five points on P1. Um, really, I've not looked at compactification. I mean, the metric and the symplectic structure does not extend. And, okay, and then uh, real quick, um, back to the very beginning when you had said the things you wanted to classify, you had integral system, that looked like a reasonable thing, and then the second thing was this lax condition, and that looked to me, just you know, very quickly looked to me like, said, my thing is in some way a Hitchin system. Right. But what about some kind of more, is it possible to give a sort of more abstract c criterion, something that would just sort of be in the, purely in the integrable system world or purely in symplectic geometry or like, which symplectic manifolds are we looking at or? Yeah, I mean, people in integrable systems have looked at this. I mean, are there integrable, you know, does every integrable equation have a, a lax pair? Um, there are ones that don't and they have these like multiplicative lax pairs and this gets into, you know, sort of a you know, multiplicative Hitchin systems. Um, it could be that there are integrable systems which don't fit into either of those, that there are the ones that are more additive, that have these exponentials, that don't, don't have a billion fibers, but um, c, c stars. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult. Um, yeah. I would first of all like, like to look at the simplest question and then... Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank Philip again.